Hello and welcome to another lecture of ECE 205 brought to you by Mrs. OneNote. So first I want to kind of start with a recall of what we've done in the last couple of lectures. So recall that we have this uh, linear potentially forced oscillator that could potentially be damped. And previously we examined the case where we aren't damped and we have no forcing terms. In this case we found that our oscillations were bounded and could in fact be written in terms of a single cosine with uh, frequency omega naught, a amplitude r, and some phase shift uh, phi. In the second case that we examined, we looked at the case when c is zero, but we no longer have a non-trivial forcing term. So there's something over here. And we found that there were two possible outcomes here. One, we could have bounded oscillations. And in this case, our oscillations weren't pure sinusoidal type things, but they had that kind of bigger overarching uh, size to the oscillations given by r of t instead of a single fixed value for the amplitude r. And then in the other case, we found that we could have linearly growing oscillations in the case where the forcing term corresponded to a wave that has a frequency of one of one of the harmonics of the homogeneous or unforced equation. Okay, and again, these oscillations are bad because in real world situations where this model applies, or a model similar to it, if you do have these linearly growing oscillations, then that means your oscillations are going to grow without bound. And eventually one of two things will happen. Either the assumptions that we made to get this ky would break down and the differential equations would be completely different, so you don't really know exactly what will happen that in, case, or in that case. Or more realistically, the vibrations will grow sufficiently large to the point where they start uh, affecting the ability for the material of the object that you're modeling to withstand the oscillations. So you can get bridges collapsing, you can get wine glasses shattering. If you're, say, singing, your vocal cords could get very sore or get take serious damage. All of these bad possible things can happen in this case. So in the real world, we also have friction. So what we're going to examine now is case three and four, which are the last two cases. And this is really simply the case where C is not equal to zero. Okay, so here we could have F is equal to zero, or this is what I'll call case three, or we could have F is not equal to zero. Okay, so in the real world, there's this kind of dampening here that's usually due to something like friction, right? Like if I start a uh, spring going back and forth, eventually it'll stop due to friction causing uh, energy to be lost via heat of heating up the spring. Or if I have, say, the pendulum problem, just to draw it out again, if I set a pendulum like this and I drop it and let it go, there is some friction here and potentially some air resistance here that will slow down the ball and convert mechanical energy into heat energy. Okay, so uh, in the real world, we do have that the C is not equal to zero. So let's see if it's possible to use this C to be able to control these oscillations so that this case here isn't realized where generally speaking, if C is exactly equal to zero and you have kind of an arbitrary forcing term, you will have these linearly growing oscillations. Okay, and once we actually talk about Fourier series, that will make a little bit more sense why if I have an arbitrary function, there would be some component of cosine of omega naught times t. Okay, so motivation done. Let's rewrite the equations and get to work. Okay, so just to save a little bit of time here, recall that in case three, where we have C is non-zero and K are the forcing term is zero, we previously mentioned at the end of the last lecture that from here our characteristic polynomial would be, our characteristic equation would be this, and the roots R1 comma two would simply be this thing here, where I'm simply defining R1 to be the positive root and R2 to be the negative root. So now we know that depending on the sign of the thing under the square root, uh, we will get different possible solutions coming out. So let's examine each one of these cases in turn to see what happens and physically interpret what the solution is telling us. Okay, so in the first case, which we are going to call under damped motion, and you'll see why in a second. So this is going to be the case where this term under the square root is less than zero. 
So explicitly, we're going to simply have that the square root of c squared, oops, uh, don't square root, simply that c squared minus 4mk is going to be less than 0. Okay, so this implies pretty straightforwardly that c is going to be less than the square root of 4mk. Okay, so I have another bound here that c has to be greater than the negative of that thing, but we don't really need, care about that term here. We really just care that this thing is negative. Okay, so in here, what happens within this case? Well, pretty direct comp uh, computations, if I plug this in here, simply gives me that my r, say 1, the positive root, will simply be this expression here. So since these are complex valued, we know from our previous work that the solutions of these are simply going to be a sums of sines and cosines multiplied by this exponentially decaying term in this case. So here we would simply find that our solutions y for this case of underdamped motion would simply be given by, well here we're going to have an e to the negative c over 2m times t from this component here, and then uh, multiplied by this we're going to have a c1 times a cosine of say omega naught t plus a c1 sine of omega naught t. Okay, so here let's kind of just recall that before we've rewritten something of this form in that amplitude phase form where I rewrote it as a single cosine. So we can do that here. I'm going to suppress the details. If you want a refresher, you can go back to where I did it in the previous lecture or uh, where it was done in the text in the previous lecture, but we can rewrite this whole thing y as this thing here. Okay, so now that we have this, we can analyze what's really happening here. So just like what we had before in the previous lecture, we can think of this component sitting here this whole term here as being the kind of envelope for these oscillations because it tells me what the maximum amplitude could potentially be over any given period of the cosine function. So here if I just think of this r e to the, this thing here, well r is just going to be a number, right? So r is going to be in particular a positive number of this form. So here if I take the positive well, if I take this function as it is, it will start up here at the value of r, whatever r is, and then this will just exponentially decay over time. So this function here, this r e to the negative c over 2 mt, will look something like this as time advances. So it eventually will go to zero, okay? So here, since this cosine can be positive or negative, we also need to bound it below. And again, the bounding below function would just be this thing with the negative in front of it. So here we get another bound down here at minus r, and this will kind of decay over here. So what is this telling us about our oscillations? Well, it's telling us that our oscillations will be dampened over time. Uh, within this case, we don't have these kind of linear oscillations that happen forever, or these kind of bounded oscillations that oscillate in terms of their uh, amplitude, or these linear growing oscillations, instead we have oscillations that decay here. So basically what's going to happen here, so if I plug in t, I get cos of phi, whatever that is, so I'll get some value here, and this will just be my cos of phi as my initial condition, and then what's going to happen as t increases, depending on the value here, I'm going to get something that goes up and down, and oscillates between these points, okay? So in this case, we're actually going to reach these upper and lower bounds, and this is purely because whenever uh, the cosine term is t for some value of time, then r of t is just going to be whatever the upper bound is, right? Or the lower bound, depending on if it's positive one or negative one, okay? So we'll get these infinite oscillations occurring forever, and that's why we call this thing under damp. Okay. And one thing I want you to note here is that this function, as it is written, is not periodic because it's decreasing over time, right? So you can't really refer to this omega not as a period anymore, so you usually call it a quasi-period instead. <laughs> 
Okay, so quasi-period, and again, time-varying amplitude because the amplitude changes over time. So just highlighting this in here to make it a bit cleaner. Uh, this curve that I'm highlighting here is the upper bound for the amplitude, and this thing is the lower bound for the amplitude. And again, we get the positive and negative purely because sine can be positive or negative, a positive one or negative one. Okay, so that is the, this for this case, okay? So this is underdamped because we have these infinite oscillations, okay? So that's just our choice of nomenclature there, but this will make more sense once I start explaining the next case. Okay, so if we had underdamped uh, over here, the next kind of natural thing might be overdamped, right? So in the under case, this was thing was less than zero, which allowed us to have these uh, sine and cosine terms. Now, if we uh, instead have the condition that this c squared minus r4mk uh, is instead greater than zero, what happens? Well, in this case, I know that our roots r1 and r2 will simply look like this. So since these terms are greater than zero, I have two distinct roots. And when we have two distinct roots, we know that our fundamental set for the solutions to this homogeneous equation will simply be two exponentials with these different uh, decay or growth rates here. So in this case, we would simply have that y is equal to c1e to the r1t plus c2e to the r2t where R1 is different from R2. Okay, so it's pretty clear that this solution isn't oscillatory because these things here are real numbers and thus I'm going to have a sum of two exponentials, but just like kind of the previous cases, we have kind of the open question at this point, does this decay or does this grow or does one of these decay and the other one grow? What's happening here, right? Because if, uh, if here my r1 or r2, so let's clean that up. So in this case, if r1 or r2 is greater than zero, we would have that y would be unbounded. And again, this is a case that I don't want, right? Because if y is unbounded, that means things are growing exponentially, things fall apart, quite literally, things explode. So we don't want this. So let's see if this can be the case. So pretty trivially, one thing that we can look just by looking at R1 and R2. So this R2 has this negative of this term, whereas this has a plus of this term, and we know this thing's positive, right? So pretty clearly, we know that R1 has to be greater than R2 just because of their form, okay? So just note that this is true, okay? So just cleaning that a little bit up, let's check Let's check this. Note that R1 is greater than R2. So in this case, we can say that if R1 is less than 0, then Y is bounded. Okay, so this is the thing that I want to check. Okay, so if I can show that this is the case, then Y will be bounded. Well, will R1 be less than 0 or no? Well, let's just notice some facts, okay? So the first thing that I can notice is that for uh, any of these values for C, we could simply say C will be greater than or equal to, in particular, uh, C squared, right? Because it's gonna be exactly equal to C squared, but if I subtract something from this, that makes this thing smaller, right? So equals to here would only hold in the case where the thing under the square root was zero, which we are assuming is not the case. So I could scriggle this out here if I wanted, and let's go ahead and do that, okay? So I honestly have this inequality here. Okay, so how does this thing help me? Well, if I wanna show that R1 is less than zero, I can note R1 is this thing here. So if I can go from this inequality to building this whole expression here, then I might be able to show it's less than zero, okay? So how do I go forward from here? Well, if this is the case, then it immediately follows that negative C will be less than negative the square root. Okay, so this gives me a negative C, which I have up here uh, in terms of R. 
Okay, so now if I add this square root to both sides, I can simply write and this looks more similar to R1, but I'm missing this 2m factor, okay? And now I can freely divide by 2m at this point without changing the inequality because we know mass is positive. So from here, I can rewrite this as this term here plus this thing. And this is going to be less than zero, but at the same time, this is R1. Okay, so R1 in this case is less than zero. So what we then can conclude is that R1 is less than R2. I'm sorry, other way. And this is less than zero, okay? So since this is the case, then I can go back over here and I can notice, hey, these are both exponentially decaying, okay? So we have this and thus we can say, thus Y is bound doing a little off-camera screen up cleanup so since this y is bounded that tells me that these things aren't growing right but further I can go a little bit further with the statement and we can note that since both of these things are less than zero what's going to happen in this case is that these are going to be decaying exponentials right so when I take the limit as of y as t goes to infinity I'm going to get zero so I could say further the limit as t goes to infinity of y is equal to zero. Okay, and now finally we can note the next kind of natural question to ask is, does this oscillate? Well, pretty clearly this can't oscillate, right? So if you wanted to, you could chase out the details. So if I take this thing and say, set it equal to zero and count the number of zeros, you can show that there's either one zero at most or infinitely many zeros, okay? So infinitely many zeros in the case where C1 is equal to C2 and less than or equal to one zero otherwise, right? So if one of these terms is zero, then I have just a pure exponential, which can't be zero. And if I have both of these together, then it can be zero once. Okay, so your text has some plots of this. So instead of trying to chase out the different little cases here, let's just look at an example here. Okay, so in this case, we have uh, two constants, and again, these two uh, values of r, both of which are negative. And here you see that we kind of get this initial hump up here, and then it decays down to zero. Okay, so depending on the initial conditions, you could have something that would say start at some point here, go up, and then decay, or maybe start here, down shoot, and then decay, something like that. Those are kind of the possibilities of uh, the cases here. Okay. And now, why do we call this overdamped? Well, within this uh, framework here, this thing is damped so much to the point that all those oscillations we had completely disappeared, okay? So sometimes you want overdampedness, sometimes you don't want overdampedness. For instance, one spot where you wouldn't want something to be overdamped is, say, an application of being in a car. Okay, so in this case, overdampedness is bad. Why? Well, if you're in a car, so we have kind of our little picture of a car here, and you say are driving along the road and there's a big bump here, okay? So if you hit this bump, you don't really want your car to jerk up and then just stop immediately because you're dumping all of that energy from hitting this hole pretty much immediately, right? So what you'd really want here is you'd want, uh, if this is kind of your neutral state, you'd maybe want so your energy from hitting the bump goes blah, and you get this kind of initial condition over here. You want it to kind of go back and forth like this. So you kind of slowly dissipate this energy over time as, as opposed to getting like hit and then all of a sudden the energy just gets zapped out, right? So kind of putting that in words. Okay, so just in words, if you're in a car and you hit a bump, then if the suspension is over damped, then the energy dissipates immediately, which can cause jerking, other issues there. That said, if the car is uh, in this case over here of this under dampness, you don't want these oscillations to go kind of on forever because say if you're on a highway driving at relatively high speeds, then each little bump in the road or any little swaying to the road, because roads aren't perfectly fat, flat, so that'll in introduce a forcing term, uh, but all those little vibrations will kind of stick around for a while. 
So you really don't want it to be in this scenario or in this scenario here. So just to tie this over to give you kind of some applications here, here's two examples of cars where in this video, which I will put so that you can look at it, uh, this is actually looking at the vibrations in the car. So this one's one that was, well, both of these are in the case where they are underdamped, but in this case, you get the oscillations occurring for a really long time, relatively speaking. Whereas here, you can just see that it kind of very quickly dies out and kind of goes back to the little flat baseline. Okay, so here you don't want uh, something to be like completely like this, but you don't really want your car to be exactly like this. Okay, so here there's kind of actually some fun uh, little clips in this video where they actually uh, test vibrating the car to see what's happening with the suspension. So in practice, this is how you would actually apply this material that we've done to say the case of a car. Okay, so when could over damping be good? Well, to give another example in the case of a car, again, if you're on the highway, you basically are solving this uh, problem here, but with a forcing term sitting over here. And that forcing term will always cause these vibrations to keep coming up, right? So in that case, if you're on a highway driving speed, then over damping can be good because it can eliminate these wobbles from the road not being perfectly smooth. So ideally, uh, if you wanted to kind of get the best of both world, you, worlds, you could have a suspension system that changes based off the speed that you're traveling, that kind of a thing. And you've really have experienced both of these situations when driving, right? You've been in a situation where you hit a bump and you physically feel the car oscillate back and forth multiple times. So there the oscillations decrease over time, so that's really over damped. And then you've probably been in situations where you feel that like you hit a bump or something like that, and then the car just kind of settles down to no movement, okay? Again, it can happen at high speeds or low speeds for the overdamped case there, but generally speaking, you care about it more when you're on a highway because you don't want that forcing term to, again, cause lots of these wibble, wiggles and wobbles, and you don't want to be in a car that's vibrating like crazy on the highway, right? That's not fun. Okay, so like with the three little piggies, uh, where you have one that's too hot, one that's too cold, and one that's just right, and here you have one uh, type of damping that's overdamped, one that's underdamped, and we actually have a third one that you could call just right, but we're going to call critically damped motion. Okay, so when something's critically damped, what do we want to be true? Well, if it's critically damped, then we want that uh, square root of don't need the square root there, but you could leave it if you wanted. But we want that c squared minus 4mk term to be exactly equal to 0. Okay, so what happens in this case where this thing is ex exactly 0? Well, in this case, we would have our roots, say r1 and r2, would be the same value. So we'd have r1 is equal to r2, and we're just going to call this thing uh, Okay, so r would be explicitly equal to, if we go over here where we defined r, uh, this term would be zero, so we're just gonna get this minus c over 2m, okay? So here, if we are in this situation, what do our solutions look like? Well, we know when we have two repeated roots, the general solution is going to consist of one exponential with this term. And notice again, this exponential is decaying because this thing's going to be uh, negative, plus a uh, t times this exponential, okay? So this term here is still decaying because this uh, exponential term decays faster than time. Okay, and again here, it's pretty trivial that both of these exponential terms, which they're really the same exponential term, but it's clear that we have decay here, so we can clearly say that the limit as t goes to infinity of y of t, this thing in this case is just going to be zero. So everything is going to zero again. And here we just kind of call this one critically damped because it's exactly at that edge where you go between the under damp and damped and the over damped situations. Okay, so just for completion here, if I include a picture, this is one example of a under damped uh, situation and here I just purely picked my constants to be one 
So in this case, I have C1 is equal to C2 is equal to one, okay? But depending on what you pick for the different cases, you could have potentially one zero here or no zeros, right? Like if one of these terms is zero, then the only zero you're either going to have is at the point zero where the T goes to zero or nowhere. Okay, so without a forcing term, if I have any dampening at all, uh, TLDR, we either have this situation where, it decay, where the vibrations decay to zero, or we have this situation where it immediately decays to zero without any vibrations, or this situation here where it also immediately decays to zero without any vibrations. Okay, so now let's look at an example of just kind of putting some of this material that we've done in the general case together to see how you might apply it for a real world problem. Okay, so here I'm just going to take this example straight from the book so I don't have to rewrite everything. And I'll put my comment on the solution here and fill in some of the gaps that the text skips. Okay, so suppose a 64 pound weight stretches a spring six inches in equilibrium and a dash pot provides a dampening force of C pounds per each foot second for velocity. So let's just break this thing down and see what's really happening here. Okay, so I have a spring and when the spring is at rest, where I put this uh, weight here, that has a weight of 64 pounds, then this spring from its default rest state, say here, if it was at rest, this distance between here and here is six inches, okay? And then the rest of this problem, this tells me about this uh, dampening force C and it's really just telling me the units of this dampening force. So the only thing I really have to worry about with C is that the units are correct. Okay, so if I want to put this into my uh, equations of motion, I would use the fact that my equations were M double prime plus CY plus KY is equal to zero in the case where I don't have any forcing terms. And here we don't mention any forcing terms. Okay, so here we say that M is two slugs. So what is a slug? Well, it's not the creepy crawly thing that appears in gardens and places like that. A slug is a unit of uh, mass, but using SAE instead of uh, metric here. Okay, so when I say pounds, I'm really not talking about a force, I'm talking about a weight. So in order to convert from pounds into a unit of mass within the pound framework, that system of units, I have to divide 32 by G. And G in feet per second squared is roughly 32, 32 point something. So you can round this to two. If you wanted, you could use more precision, but yeah, generally speaking, you usually assume gravity is 16 feet per second squared. Okay, so that's why slugs, slugs is purely because we need mass, not weight. Okay, and then beyond here, how do we find K? Well, k is that hook's constant and k is really the amount of weight divided by the distance that was traveled with it so here since everything else including c is in feet per second here we want to divide by 0.5 to convert from inches to feet so here when i divide this out that gives me my value of k so if i put all this together that's where i get this equation here now note i do not know what c is in this problem and parts A, B, and C want me to actually, well, part A wants me to find a value of C, and part C and D want me to compute some results here. Okay, so here I want to solve this thing, and the various types of solutions I give, I get will tell me different types of dampening that occurs. So to solve it, I first find the characteristic polynomial here, pretty straightforward. And now that I have this, I want to find the roots, so this are, well, these are my two roots, okay? So if I want to have critical dampening, so if my dampening is critical, then I have that this stuff under the square root has to be equal to zero, okay? So dampening being critical, this as the intermediary form tells me that C squared minus eight times 128 is equal to zero, okay? So from here, you can clearly see that you can solve for C pretty easily. And I don't take the negative root here uh, simply because C can't be negative for it to actually have the meaning that it physically is supposed to happen, right? 
If it's negative, then motion causes more motion. It literally explodes. Okay, so from here, I can compute what C needs to be, and a good check is always to check the units here, right? So if you want, here I have uh, foot-pounds for this one attached to the 128. Uh, the 8 comes from 4AC, so the units of this thing are just the units of here, so that's my slugs. And if you multiply those guys out, I'm going to simply get pounds squared uh, per second per feet. So if I chase that out, I get my uh, correct units here. Okay, so with this setup here, the next two bits are pretty trivial, right? All they want me to do is find the various displacements for positive time if the motion is either critically damp or is critically dampened with two different sets of initial conditions. Okay, so for the first one, here again was my differential equation. You basically use the fact that C is given by this 32, plug it in, find the roots, and here you get this thing here. Again, this is approximate because assuming that G is 16 is approximate. Okay, so now that we have this, we need to apply the initial condition. So adding the stuff, extra step here. So now that we have this solution, we want to apply these particular initial conditions. So we can apply them in whatever order we want, but we need to take its derivative to get this term here. And then all I do is I set one, well, to be explicit here, I uh, to apply this initial condition here, I simply set one equal to C1, the other term goes away. And here to apply this initial condition, I simply plug in and get my 20 from this other side here is simply going to be equal to negative eight times C2, which they do this one down here. So I'll just remove those comments. Okay, and here fixing their derivative, that would just be this term here, right? Okay, so when you plug this in with this, you simply get this equation, you can solve it. Now you get this thing here. Okay, so if you want, you can plot it. They plotted it in the text, pretty straightforward. So in this case, again, it's over damped, so there's no oscillation. In the other case, it's os or sorry, critically damped. In the other case, it's also going to be critically damped, so you will also have no oscillations there. And just for completion, I will copy that guy over real quick. But at this point, it's just differentiating and applying the initial conditions. You should be able to do it, okay? So the main thing I want you to get out of this example is this actual fact here that you need to divide by gravity to get the mass because mass is not weight. That's more of a physics thing, but just watch out for that here. Okay, so now that we've examined this scenario here of the case where I have dampening with forcing and kind of considered those three different regimes, let's end this lecture by talking about the forced problems again. Okay, so the equations of most motion for the first force problem with damping are simply going to be, well, this term doesn't really change, so let's just write it out real quick. So we get a K1 plus some forcing term over here, okay? So we are going to assume that we can just look at forcing terms of this form here, cos of omega t, okay? So why are we assuming that we can do forcing terms of this form here? Well, you'll see that in a bit more detail when we do Fourier series, but for now, just keep in mind that for any realistic forcing function that you will ever have, you can decompose it into a sum of cosines, okay? So from here, we've noticed before that if C was equal to zero, so here if C is equal to zero, then it's possible to have this grow without bound, right? So if this is true, then we can have unbounded solutions. So now the natural question to ask is, well, if C is non-zero, can we still have unbounded solutions? So in words, just the statement here. If this is non-zero, can we have unbounded solutions? So the natural way to kind of approach this here, we really don't know what omega is. We really don't know what these terms here are. So what we really want to do is just try to solve this equation as is for all possible values of this forcing term omega. Try to find the maximum value of omega that we could possibly have for something of this form. And just our intuition says that we might be able to obtain the maximum uh, amplitude by looking for function forcing functions of this term. 
if your intuition doesn't scream that, that's not a problem. Uh, it's something that you'll notice why that should be true once we do Fourier series. So this is pretty straightforward of a problem to do. So you should be able to do it on your own, to be honest. But let's just go through the proof in the text for trying to solve this equation here and kind of focus on the key areas where things can be maybe not as clear. Okay, so here, our goal is to solve this thing for omega. So here, the first thing that they mention is that this cosine of omega t does not satisfy the complementary equation. Why would this be true? Well, just from the form of this solution here, we've previously noted, and I'll scroll up to that point, but we've previously noted that the solutions are of this form here, and this c divided by the 2m is non-zero in this case, right? So further than that, if we have these oscillating terms here, they're going to be multiplied by that decaying exponential term, right? So in either case, we're going to get that cosine of omega t for any value of omega will not solve the equation. Okay, this is useful but it, because it allows me to assume the form of the solution to simply be this term here, right? So since I can assume a solution of this form, I can pretty readily find the solutions, right? So kind of a common or a nice way that you can go about uh, examining here to verify that cosine doesn't satisfy the equation or cosine of omega t doesn't is just to assume it does, plug it in and see where you can't actually solve it. Okay, so from here what we do is we differentiate this term twice so that we have all the derivatives that we need, and then we just take them and put them into the forced equation. Okay, so here at this point, uh, this is just computing the left-hand side of the equation, and here we're really saying that this is equal to the forcing term that we discussed previously, just this f naught cosine of omega t. So really what the text is doing here is saying this is f naught cosine of omega t. Okay, so here once you do this, you can now get a system of equations, this here. Okay, so that's where this system comes from. Okay, we know how to solve systems of equations. So you solve this for a and b, pretty straightforward, and you plug it into the onsatz that you made up here. Okay, so once you do this, and simplify a bit, you get this particular solution here. Okay, so just a bunch of algebra, you should be able to do that type of algebra now. Okay, so now what you do is that same trick that we did before to rewrite this in amplitude phase form. Okay, so this takes a little bit of work, but it's not too much. Uh, just recall that your r, the term that's sitting right here, which I will highlight this, uh, this thing is simply given by your square root of c1 squared plus c2 squared. So this is your r of t with all those other parameters here. And then from here, the way that you find this phi is by satisfying one of these two equations here, or the tangent term if you want. Okay, so again, why do I want it in this uh, amplitude phase form? Well, this lets me pretty readily interpret what's happening with these solutions and to interpret what the amplitudes are. In particular, we know that the absolute maximum that the amplitude could potentially ever be, it's not guaranteed to be it, but it could potentially be it, is the maximum value of this thing here for various values of theta, or sorry, not theta, of omega with all the other terms fixed. Okay, so that's really why we want it in this form because this thing is easier to maximize than this thing over here. Okay, so now this little bit of text here, you can ignore it for the purposes of this problem, but this is just giving you a good way to compare these results to what we've had before, which is good to do. But our goal for this question is really to determine like if we still have unbounded solutions when we have any amount of dampening. Okay, so how do we go about doing that? Well, a key thing for any uh, differential equation is dealing with these initial conditions, right? So in general, we want to solve this uh, differential equation with these extra conditions applied, right? So if we're going to have these extra conditions, we need to find the homogeneous solutions to be able to match the initial conditions, okay? So from here, the uh, y sub p this is just the y sub p that we found over here, right? This is this y sub p, 
and this y sub c, well, that depends on what's happening with the solution itself, right? Previously, in uh, previous lectures, we found that we had these three possible cases depending on the different, different dampening. I lied, that was earlier in this lecture. Okay, so now it turns out, and we showed this earlier, that for all of these cases, this limit goes to zero, right? And that didn't care what C1, C2, and C3 were, and really it was the fact in these two cases that this exponential thing goes to zero and these oscillate or very slowly diverge, much slower than the exponential. And in this case, these uh, R1 and R2 terms were less than zero. Okay, so since all of these go to zero, in the limit, if we just cared about the limiting behavior of the function, then what we would simply need to care about is what the limiting behavior of this function here is. Okay, so if we care to know whether or not it's going to increase without bound, again, cosine is bounded, so we just focus on this r sub t. So the TLDR for the material kind of from there down to here is that the effects of the initial conditions are non-trivial, but they're transitory in nature. Uh, they go away after a certain period of time, and the only thing that really kind of dominates is this term here, okay? So if it turns out that this R of T goes to zero, then everything fully dampens. If R of T goes to some constant, then we get fixed vibrations forever. And if R of T goes off to infinity, then we have divergence and bad things happen, in the real world problems at least. Okay, so now the only thing we care about is this amplitude here, okay? And I basically said that earlier, but this is the mathematical justification for why only this matters in terms of determining the behavior as t goes to infinity. Okay, so from here, they just kind of do a few tricks. I'm going to skip over the tricks, but the basic idea is they're maximizing this thing for omega. So if you wanted to do it really brute force wise, which I wouldn't suggest doing it, you could take the derivative of this with respect to omega and try to set it equal to zero and solve for it. But what they do here is they simply notice, hey, this thing's at a maximum when the denominator's at a minimum. Let's minimize the denominator and think of it in terms of the various parameters. And that is honestly a better way of going about it, but it's your choice of how to approach this problem here. Okay, so once you go through and once all the smoke clears, you actually find that there is in fact a maximum frequency uh, omega max, and it's just going to be given by this thing here. It's not too bad to do it, you just have to follow the work here. I'm going to skip it just to try to keep lectures a bit shorter than usual. And from here, uh, given that this omega max exists, we then compute what p of omega max is, and that will tell us, well, f not divided by what the max value is. So after you do that and all the smoke clears, you get that r max is simply equal to this thing here. What does this tell us? Well, this is going to be finite as long as c is non-zero, thus we have some dampening involved, and this 4km minus c squared is non-zero. Now this thing, is zero exactly in the critically damped setup. So we can summarize this as a theorem and in the lecture at that point. Okay, so just putting the above together, if you have something that looks like this as a function of omega, then in this case, you achieve a maximum value of this. So if your dampening is above a certain bit, it really dampens it pretty heavily, and you get this case. And in the other case, if this is below that critical threshold, but still greater than zero, because we don't talk about zero dampening, well, non or less than zero dampening, uh, then this is your maximum amplitude and it's achieved then. Okay, so the main thing I want you to get out of this is not to memorize the theorem or to memorize like the processes of maximizing this. It's just more the idea of how I went about doing this, okay? So we started with something like this. We solved a, uh, basically an infinite number of differential equations for different values of omega, and then we maximized them over, or maximized the solutions as a function of omega. Okay, so this is something that's called parameter analysis, and it's done in a lot of, for, well, to solve a lot of real-world problems. Okay.
And I just kind of skimmed that because you should be able to read this on your own. I just wanted to try to focus in on the spots where I thought students might get stuck. If you have questions, feel free to ask in office hours, but I am not going to directly test you on your knowledge of this theorem and everything you can do without having this theorem, given that you know how to solve differential equations of this form with the forcing term attached to it. Okay, so that will be it for lecture 12. Again, it was kind of one of those theory heavy type things with kind of a handful of examples, but really what I'm going to ask you on our, I'll give you an equation like this, and I might ask you things about it's dampening, something like that, or I could give you, instead of giving you the full equation with the coefficients, I could give you something like this here where I tell you some information about the string and the physical problem and your goal or your job is to set up to figure out what the governing equations are and to solve them and analyze the cases. Okay, so that's the skill I want you to get out of this lecture. Okay, I will see you in the next lecture and I'll talk to you later. And of course, we can't leave without having a meme. So here, it's a harmonic oscillator. First year's, what Elvish, or what's the Elvish way to solve an ODE? Professor, guessing the solution. Yeah, so, yep, yeah, there's your meme. I'll talk to you next week now.